Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 110. What's new for two? The best newer two-player board games. Live from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You too can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, that's New York, Toronto time, at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, first off, I do have to apologize for us not being here last week. Uh, last Sunday, we were cleaning up the office. And I, don't, I don't think you can really see it behind us. Most of the work happened kind of down here and on these shelves down here. But we were cleaning up the office, and I don't know I, if I, like, inhaled some dust or I hope we didn't have any mold or something, but, like, something kind of got stuck in my throat, and it ended up turning into a pretty nasty throat infection, which I'm still not 100%. So if my voice is a bit off tonight, that's what that's from. I am much better though. Um, but last week, I didn't even have a voice. So there was no way we could record. Same with the Gloomhaven actual stream. If you showed up for that, I do apologize. And for those of you like looking for a podcast to come out on Tuesday, that didn't happen either. So we do apologize, but we're back at it. We don't miss often, but it does happen now and then. Now tonight... I've got someone who is brand new to the hobby looking for two player games to play with their girlfriend. Um, tying into that, we've got a review of one of the hottest new two player games out there right now, a game that is like storming the board game industry and winning awards all over the place. So you get to hear my thoughts on that one. And trust me, they'll be a little bit more interesting than when you usually hear. And then so we can review, uh, we got some Jaws of the Lion, we got some Seven Wonders, Clans of Caledonia and Terra Mystica being played fine. And I actually got Deanna to play some For the Queen, which is a pass the stick style story game or RPG. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, any comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hood us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Now, there's just a couple of comments we want to highlight this week. First is from Jacob Jakamiak Jack, uh, about our actual play of Gloomhaven Scenario 24. I know it's a bit late. The video is months old at this point, but I believe you've played that stunned monsters didn't retaliate at all. Correct way would be, as long as retaliate is on their sheet, not modifier card, it's always on, and even stunned, they retaliate. Only retaliate from modifier deck wouldn't be applied while stunned. That makes scenario way, way harder. Soothsinger can stun a lot, but killing harrower or deep terrors in one hit isn't easy, so requires taking lots of retaliation damage. If you have a few, very few ranged attacks. As our only healer, with one card mainly used as song, playing a Soothsinger, I really had problems to keep my friends and myself alive. Our Sunkeeper luckily could heal himself too, Scoundrel and Mind Thief. Especially with those vipers and imps who like to poison and blocked healing very often. We took the straight ahead way. We decided to keep terrors, as decided deep terrors could be annoying, spreading themselves, strong ranged attacks. And also, the longer way isn't so great if you have a sluggish sunkeeper. We took a hard beating, but won at the end of, of level very hard, scenario level six. Well, thanks for the uh, long comment there, Jacob. I wanted to bring this one up, despite being on one of our older videos, as it highlights a rule I see people getting wrong all the time, like even now, even with uh, Jaws of the Lion too. And this is one that, yes, we did. We got it wrong during this actual play. Now, what Jacob missed here in his critique is he actually missed that we got two things wrong, both of which I found very easy to mess up. And again, I want to note that these are also true in Jaws of the Lion, and I see people new to Jaws of the Lion making these same mistakes because they're not necessarily obvious from the rules. First off is stun. 
Now, it's easy to think that if a target's stunned, you just skip it. Like, just uh, ignore that monster, skip over its turn, skip over everything. That's not true. Stun just means the enemy doesn't play out its activation card. Everything else that enemy does still happens. So this means any status effects on it, other status effects still happen. Like, for example, wounds. Or if there's this ongoing scenario effect that affects the monsters, they're still going to happen. Any buffs out there from other monsters are still going to happen. And most importantly, and what's at play here in that scenario, is innate abilities. These are the things that are written on the monster's stat card, not the action cards. This includes, of course, retaliate. In addition to that, stun monster may also retaliate if it's given retaliate from a different monster. So if there's something else that like gives everything in range three retaliate, that stun monster is still going to retaliate. And this just shows, again, the complexity of Gloomhaven. And one of the benefits of streaming it, when we can get extra eyes on mm. the game to help catch mistakes. Yeah. Now, the second thing I know we got wrong, because we got it wrong in over half of our actual play videos, intentionally, until we were uh, corrected by Temujin, our guy in the chair, is the rules for poison, specifically how to get rid of poison. When you get healed, if you're poisoned, you get to remove the poison status. That part's simple. Um, we never got that part wrong. What we got wrong is that after doing that, we still had healing happen. And that's what doesn't happen. If someone heals you for six and you're poisoned, you just lose the poison. That six health goes nowhere. You kind of lose it. We played that wrong for a very, very long time. Now, as Sean said, Having more eyes on our live streams is awesome. So I do want to reiterate that we appreciate feedback like this. Like, please point out that we did something wrong. If you're ever watching one of our videos, actual plays, reviews, unboxings, anything, our, our live stream right now, and we get something wrong, please call us out on it. I play a lot of different games, and I have a huge number of rules floating around in my head for all those games. And now and then, I get things mixed up or forget some of the small details. All right, well, next, a comment on our Founders of Gloomhaven unboxing video. Eddie Cassells writes, Thanks for the video. I really enjoyed the solo mode for this game. <laughs> the box itself is surprisingly heavy, over two kilograms. That seems to be a thing for Gloomhaven. Like, Isaac has decided he wants to have the heaviest games on the market by weight as well as, uh, like, volume, I guess, by, by physically. Well, thanks, Eddie. I, I still haven't gotten a chance to check this one out. Um, I did flip through the rules, and I got to say, I don't think it's just a physical box that's heavy in this one. This looks like a meaty, heavy game, like heavier than Gloomhaven. And Gloomhaven is not nearly as light as many people think a dungeon crawler should be. Well, that's all for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. Despite missing out on a new podcast last week, we haven't actually slowed down all that much on releasing content. New videos and blog posts continue to flow, so don't worry, there's plenty of bellhop content to get you through. Yep, yeah, and we keep track of all of that new content on the Tabletop Bellhop weekly newsletter. This is something you can sign up to receive in your inbox. Uh, once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we released in the week previous. Now, again, since we didn't have a podcast last week, I just skipped over it. So you kind of got a double dose today that lists all the new blog posts, reviews that we put up, actual plays, and everything else. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar, or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, up next, I want to officially announce the winner of our YouTube partner status, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Giveaway. The winner is Kevin Criswell. Congratulations, Kevin. Now, I've already confirmed Kevin's entry, and we'll have that game on its way once we finish up with all this Prime Day stuff. So it may not go out until next week, but we'll get it out to you soon, Kevin. No worries. All right, earlier this month, I created and launched the official Tabletop Bellhop US merch store through supplements. There you can find Tabletop Bellhop t-shirts, three different designs, uh, tank tops, hoodies, coffee mugs. I think there's a sticker and a uh, mouse pad. I don't know. There's a couple other things. Basically, whatever they let me create, I created. Well, you can find the shop at merch, M-E-R-C-H dot stream elements dot com slash tabletop bellhop just like brian up there did <laughs> now i'm very sorry to say right now the shop is open to the U our fans in the u.s only 
on the U.S. people, the is currently working with Canadian providers. Unfortunately, that has been delayed and is now yet again due to how poorly Ottawa seems to be handling the COVID crisis. We promise to let you know when Canadian merch is an option. We know people have been waiting for it, and trust me, we really want to see you in our stuff. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere on social media or in person. Tonight, we have a question from Willie Waldman who writes, My girlfriend and I are into gaming. I would like to know some games that you think are the most fun for two players. Any category, any size, any type. We play at home. We're new to this. So any help would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. So Willie and his girlfriend are just getting into gaming. So first off, longtime fans of the show know we've covered two-player games a number of times. And yes, this is another two-player game topic. I get it. Of all the questions we get at Tabletop Bellhop, the most popular topic by far is two player games of some sort that or how'd you get what game got you into the hobby everyone asked that one too but otherwise it's a two player this two player that they always want to know and i gotta say lately it's spiked even more and i have a feeling that's probably due to the global pandemic and way more people playing with smaller game groups because they're stuck with playing just the people in their immediate family not necessarily stuck some people like their family well true enough <laughs> but since we have talked about this before what we'll do is drop links to all of our previous two-player episodes mm -hmm. and content in the show notes so that when you have time you can dive through all of it we've got things like best two-player games for date nights best two-player cooperative games quick and easy to learn two-player games and more now, since we have talked about two-player games a number of times, what I like to do every time this topic comes up is try to find a unique twist to the topic, so a new way to look at things. And tonight's twist comes right from the question we received from Willie, because Willie notes that he and his girlfriend are brand new to gaming and that they're willing to take out any and all types of two-player games. So that gives us a broad range. So what I want to talk about then is some of the newest two-player games to be released, games that are new for a couple of new players, right? All the new hotness tonight. Now, what this should mean for Willie is that any of the games mentioned should be able to find and be in stock. And I actually confirmed every game on the list tonight. You can currently go buy on Amazon.com as well as other online game stores like, say, GameNerds.com. Unlike many of our game recommendations, this list won't be filled with classic games or out-of-print gems that are now almost impossible to find. For this episode, at least, we are all about the new hotness. Or at least relatively new hotness. Part of the problem is with 2020, there haven't been a lot of a new games released. For one second, there's no con season for us to have tried a bunch of new games. So what I decided to do is kind of broaden it just a little bit because I, I don't haven't played enough two-player games that were released in 2020 is to go three years. I figure three years is still pretty dang new to me. So we're looking at games that were released from 2017 onward. So actually technically less than three years because 2020 is not done yet. And then we're also going to broaden it. So we're not just looking at two-player only games, but games that are any number of players, but play great with only two. Now, finally, this list isn't in any particular order. When we get to the end of the list, we'll feature a few honorable mentions, games that we felt needed to be mentioned, but didn't make our list for one reason or another. All right, the first one is a game I had actually originally planned to review tonight, but I just didn't have time to get it written. And that is the Pathfinder Adventure Card game, specifically the 2019 core set, which is the latest iteration of these Pathfinder Adventure games. Now, despite being designed for up to four players, even more if you have the expansions, this game is thought by most people to be best as either a single player or two player game experience. It's fantastic solo. It's great too. Once you add more players, there's just a little bit too much downtime and it's a little harder to coordinate your efforts. Now, Deanna and I, my wife and I have been playing through the original adventure path and that's the pathfinder term for a, a series of link stories and this one's called the dragon's demand and we've been really enjoying it. Like there's a real aspect of that. You can tell it's a Paizo game. 
Paizo became famous for writing Dungeons and Dragons adventures and then eventually making their own game with their own setting. And the story in here is fantastic. And I got to admit, there is a learning curve here. Um, this is not a light game. It's not easy to learn. There's a lot of terms. It's a complicated card game. But now that we've made it over that learning curve, we are really loving this game. If you're a fan of Dungeons and Dragons style adventures, the whole fighting goblins, leveling up, getting gear, fighting bonds, monsters, and playing out a cohesive storyline, it's well worth checking the Pathfinder Adventure card game. All right. And that is the 2019 core set for Pathfinder Adventure card game. All right, next I have the Fox in the Forest duet. What I'm going to try to do in this list is we're trying to go for a broad range of different types of games, especially since the uh, the questioner asking is brand new to games and aren't sure even what they like yet. So we're going to try to go all over the map. So we're going from like heavy card game dungeon crawling to a much lighter card game. I grew up playing traditional card games, stuff like Spades, Hearts, Euchre. And when I first heard that Renegade Games with Fox Mind had published a cooperative trick-taking game i'm like how? how how does that work like i was intrigued i'm like i gotta see this i need to know how you can make a co-op trick-taking game because trick-taking in on it's, it's just so competitive like every round you're competing to take tricks that's the whole point and then there's variations on if i want them all or not but what anyway once i got the play the chorus duet i was blown away I have to thank Terry at Renegade Games for letting me loan her, loaning me her copy because I probably would have avoided this one without getting to try it for free. Now that I played it, I recommend this one to everyone. This is a great two-player game. The only thing, though, is don't pick this one up if you want it for an intimate date night because a big part of the game is you can't talk to each other while you're playing. Well, you know, some relationships might work better that way, some might not. <laughs> true. But that was Fox in the Forest duets, and I specified duet for yes. a reason because up next i do want to talk about also the original fox in the forest and this is for players who prefer the competitive two-player games as opposed to cooperative games where you can play a little bit more take that and you can rib on each other this is the original fox in the forest this is still a a trick-taking game but a trick-taking game for two players um this is very quick to play takes up almost no room because all you need is the card deck and some scoring tokens uh my wife and i dan and i love this game it is it is a fantastic game again i gotta thank terry for lending us a copy but also tech one of our fans uh for picking us up a physical copy after we talked about how much we liked the copy we borrowed off terry this is one of those games where you got you can you don't want to take all the tricks and that's that's what makes this game work is you want to try to take just enough tricks but not all of them and if you take too many you get penalized for it and that back and forth is fantastic yeah and so that was fox in the forest which is the competitive version where fox in the forest duet is the co-op version correct I thought about spacing these out in the list to make it more clear, but I figured actually trying to clear it up right at the beginning is probably yep. better. So, all right, still sticking with card games. I don't know. I just kind of grouped these together. If you like two player card games, I suggest checking out Keyforge. This is a very unique concept for a game. It's a two player dueling card game. So, think of games like Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, Yu Gi Oh! Um, actually, this is actually the same designer as Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, Richard Garfield. Um, the thing with Keyforge, the neat thing that, that, that is that every single deck ever produced for the game and ever will be produced is 100% unique. And you only ever need one deck to play, and it's non collectible. So, you literally, I could go to the store right now and buy a deck and Sean go to the store and buy a deck. We sit down and just start playing with those two, de two decks out of the box. Go. Now, gameplay is solid and very enjoyable. I really do like the gameplay in Keyforge. But what I like even more is the fact there's no boosters. There's no deck building. There's no meta. There's no trying to follow the trends. It's just go pick up Keyforge deck. You pick up Keyforge deck. Let's play. I love that aspect of this game. Yeah. And now, for the same reason, that might not be for everybody. There are mm -hmm. people out there who are the real Magic fans who love that deck building experience. And that's not deck building during the game, but that preparing your deck to do battle against someone yeah. else. And that, that's, that's what a, I usually like to call deck construction. Deck construction. You, so, you construct your deck right. before playing. So it's, it's, that's a huge thing for a lot of people. And this game eliminates that for better or for worse. Uh, I think I tend to agree where... You know, the idea, one of the, the great things about 
early Magic tournaments back before it got kind of blown out was you could just go to a store, pick up a starter box and start playing and you'd have a random assortment mm-hmm. of cards to go. And unfortunately, the way they, the game has gone, that's not a, a thing anymore. But it was a great idea. And what Keyforge has done has brought us back to that, where you just mm-hmm. pick up a box, sit down, start to play. That was Keyforge. And to be honest, I don't have it on this list, but Magic the Gathering does have a new 2021 core set that was just released just last month. So I, it's a longer game. I figured everyone known about that one. I'm pretty sure anyone that's interested in Magic can go check that out if they want. Um, I don't know what's going on for Friday Night Magic and organized play with that with right now, if that's going on online or whatever. But for Keyforge being something brand new, so we tossed that one on here. Up next, I wanted something a little lighter. So, and no, no more cards. So we're going to throw the cards out. Um, I wanted a game that is a great gateway game to people who grew up playing traditional board games. And one of those is Kami. This takes the mechanics of checkers or drafts. This is the original game converted into an area control Euro-ish game. We got this one for the kids thinking, oh, they'll like it. It'll be fun. And I was blown away the depth of this game, the amount of strategy and tactics in it. Like this is one that I think should be on the shelf with the adult games, not with the kids games. I think by selling King Me to kids, they're like, oh, it's just checkers. And it's so not. This is a fantastic game that belongs in with the the bigger, heavier strategy board games, in my opinion. If you are at all, like if you've ever had fond memories of playing checkers, pick this up because it takes checkers to that next level. Excellent. And that is King Me. All right, we're going to we're going to jump to a whole other side of the hobby, a different type of tabletop gaming, and that is tabletop wargaming with Star Wars X-Wing 2nd Edition. Now, I got to admit, I'm not happy that Fantasy Flight rebooted X-Wing and that all of my ships and I have a lot are useless without buying an upgrade kit. I can't deny the popularity of the 2nd Edition of X-Wing and the f- changes that came with it that people seem to love. The people who continue to play X-Wing when it swapped over and the new people getting into the hobby seem to really like the updates they made with second edition. So fair enough. X-Wing always has been, and I think always will be, a fantastic dogfighting miniature game that honestly has some of the best looking miniatures you'll see in the industry with the added bonus that they all come pre-painted. Like these are completed, done, ready to use right out of the box miniatures. If you're new, like our people asking the questions tonight and thinking about getting an X-Wing, now's the perfect time because you don't have to worry about converting your old stuff. You can just start with the second edition. Now, how how expensive is Star Star Wars X-Wing to get into? I mean... One ship each isn't going to be much, but no one's going to stop at one ship each. <laughs> no, I'd, I, you know what? I'd, I'd follow tabletop deals on Twitter and you can usually find good deals. Individual ships are about 15 bucks US. Uh, the starter set tends to go on sale and you can get it for about 30 bucks. And to be honest, the starter set is a great way to build a fleet cheap because it comes with two TIE fighters and one X-Wing. So if you buy two starter sets, that's actually enough for a two-player game, full, whatever the point value is, 100 points, 300 points, I can't remember right now, because TIE Fighters are cheaper. So two TIE Fighters versus four X-Wings is about a balanced game. And then just pick up the ships that look cool is the way I play it. Now, here in Windsor at Tabletop Renaissance, they are huge about X-Wing. Like, they have tournaments and everything, and they're all about the meta and what ships combine with which, and that if you dive into it that big, it's going to be expensive. But it's like that for any of these miniature games, right? Same thing with Warhammer. It's you and I playing my orcs versus your dark elves, and we just buy the stuff that looks cool. That is a completely different game than you bring your army around different parts of North America to compete in tournaments, try to win a Golden Geek Award or whatever, a Golden Demon Award. So I think you can get in. Like It's not cheap. What I would suggest with X-Wing is split. Like, get two people. You each buy a starter set and then swap. Like, someone play Imperial, someone play Rebels. And then pick up other ships as time goes on. Now, what they have done in the new edition is there are way more than just the two factions now. Or there's the Scum and Villainy. Plus, they've also done, like, the Clone Wars stuff now. Like, there's more to it. I personally haven't kept up with second edition. So, I couldn't tell you exactly what they've done with the game. But they have made it more. So, there's more factions available now. Interesting. Well, you know, if you've got a, if you, if you want it, the investment and you like that and you've got the tabletop space, especially if you're looking to play at home, you're going to need a, is it a four three by, by four? Three. three by three. Three by oh, three. Oh, that's not bad actually. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that is Star Wars X-Wing second edition. 
All right, sticking with the war games, the one thing you don't get with X-Wing is the whole hobby side of miniature war gaming. So if you are interested in the whole hobby aspects, uh, cutting your miniatures out and assembling them and gluing them and prepping them and priming them and painting them and creating scenery and all that stuff, I am going to point you towards Warhammer Underworlds. This is a furniture miniature game from Games Workshop where you're expected to assemble and paint your own units. Though, to be honest, you don't have to paint them. Like, you can play without. Uh, the models, actually, in the core sets are snapped together, so you don't even have the glue. But there is still that assembly required. This is a card-driven skirmish game that features amazing-looking miniatures. That's the one thing Games Workshop always has been known for, probably always will be known for. And what I like about this one is it's really neat gameplay sean's played this one with me and what's really cool about this one is your objectives are card based and they change every game so it's never it's not always like sometimes it's kill all the enemies other times it's have so many of your guys on the opponent's side of the board another time it's control objectives and the fact that that's randomized for each faction every game so what your opponent's trying to do and what you're doing will be different really ups the replayability and variability of underworlds now sean and i played the original shade spire version there are new ones. Two sets came out in 2020 even. Dreadfane appears to be the newest one. What they seem to be doing with each of these editions is new boards, new rules, but it's mainly two new armies that come with them. So it's a way to get started. So what I would recommend is pick up the two armies that look the coolest to you and go with that set, and then you can always move on from there. Yeah, the really nice thing about this is, is that not knowing what your opponent is going to be doing, right? You've part, you're not only trying to achieve your own objectives, you're trying to discern what it is your opponent is trying to do mm -hmm. uh, from a you know, reasonably large set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that aspect. And the card driven was really well done. Like that, it was a, there's still dice, it's still Warhammer-ish, yeah. there's still yeah. saving throws and all that, but it, it it's definitely not the, the huge battle game that it used to be. And the other thing too with that is if you do find you enjoy that, you can always take the step to the next level of the full miniature games. Although that's going to get expensive. Yes, <laughs> but for the it cheaper is. version, it's Warhammer Underworld. All right, swapping over to more of a party style games or lighter fare, I am going to recommend Codenames Duet. Now, despite what they say on Amazon, a few places, this is not actually a two player game. It is a team based version of Codenames, but it is designed specifically to be played with either two players or two teams. And this is another one that I got to say, like Fox in the Forest, I had doubts about because I'm like, Codenames works. Like, Codenames is a really solid big group party game. How the heck do you get that to work for two teams or two players? And man, it works so well. Like, I am blown away. This is a game that I can't believe Deanna and I keep breaking out. Like, I just didn't think it would have the longevity it has. This is now one of our favorite games for date night. Later in the night, once we had a few drinks, it tends to get even more fun. Uh, the whole thing here is it's a word game, and you are trying to get the other players to pick the right words that are on the board based on a two-sided clue card, where there's a different pattern for you as there is from for your partner. So, yeah, that is Codenames Duet. All right, moving over to an abstract strategy game. I am a huge fan of two-player abstract strategy games. If you check any of our other two-player content, you're going to see games like the Duke and Onitama on there. Those are classics, though. Here is a modern one that has just come out in 2019, and it's called Shobu. This is one of those games where you could basically make it yourself at home. It's moving white and black stones on wooden boards that are just grids. And the goal is to push the opponent's stone off the board. The trick to this game is every turn you must make two moves with two different stones. The first move is passive. All you are doing is moving a piece any direction. I think it's up to two spots, including diagonally. And that, you just move the piece, nothing happens. The second, though, has to be an identical move with a different piece. So you have to make the exact same move. This one is aggressive, and this is the one that can push opponent's pieces and what you use to try to knock the opponents off. This is one of those whole chess-like abstract, uh, you know, easy to learn difficult to master everything people love about chess without having to memorize all the moves or having the complexity level much simpler really neat game sounds dead simple until you start playing going oh but i can't make that passive move to attack and i want to attack with that guy oh and if i move this stone he's gonna move that stone and trying to plan three moves ahead it's one of those style of abstract games excellent and that is shobu 
All right, I'm just going to jump back to Codenames Duet for a second based on a comment in our chat room right now. That is a cooperative game. Codenames Duet is cooperative. You are working together to try to guess the clues together. It is not a competitive game, which is a big change from the original Codenames, which was a team game where your team is competing, competing with the other team. All right, on to the next one. Here's another lighter game that is small and portable, something I love for playing at things like coffee shops. And that is Ticket to Ride New York. I think at this point, pretty much everyone in the world heard of Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride in the recent years have been releasing with the City series, a number of smaller games. Ticket to Ride New York is one of them. I just as much would recommend New York, uh, sorry, London. And now just coming up is Amsterdam. These are smaller four versions of Ticket to Ride. There are smaller that I think are awesome for playing like a pub, a coffee shop, somewhere on a small table at your kitchen table, perhaps. And they play really quickly, like in 15 minutes. The only thing you got to watch for those, if you do a coffee shop or something, there are lots of little tiny taxis in this particular version or double decker, um, double decker buses in the London version. Just be careful. You don't lose any pieces. I love these games for some reason, because like you get that ticket to ride experience without it taking two hours. Like they play in under 15 minutes. And these are particularly good to player. They are extremely cutthroat because you only have each other and it's all about trying to cut the other player off. And the game just gets better once the players get to know the different route cards so that they can judge what they think the opponents are going for. Yeah, no, I have to say, we we opened this box from plastic wrapped mm. in and, and finished a game in, I think, 25 minutes. Uh, yep. You know, rules and all, it's great. And I don't enjoy Ticket to Ride. If you if you say, hey, let's sit down and play Ticket to Ride, I'll probably hem and haw and, and see if there's another game group going <laughs> at the time. But this, again, because it's just light and fast, um, it, it's got all the fun of Ticket to Ride without the slog of Ticket mm -hmm. to Ride. Totally agree. And so that is Ticket to Ride New York or London. Or Amsterdam, or I guess. Amsterdam. I have no doubt those ones, so who knows? All right, next, I want to strongly recommend for, for a unique gaming experience, the Exit series of games, uh, particularly the Haunted Roller Coaster. But really, any of them could be on the list. But I want to call out Haunted Roller Coaster first uh, because the theme fits the season, right? Haunted Roller Coasters, it's October 14th right now. Uh, they'll still be before uh, Halloween by the time you get to listen to this episode when it comes out or it's on YouTube. So I got to recommend this one for theme plus this so far is the best gateway to the exit series of games I've played. This is one of the easier ones. It's only a two difficulty, oddly two is the easiest, two out of five. And this does such a great job at highlighting what the exit games can do and presenting a wide range of different puzzle types and ways to make you think. If you've never done one of these escape room in the boxes, I highly recommend the haunted roller coaster as as a place to start to see if you like those kinds of games so again like we're trying to recommend a wide variety of different game types here if you think you want to try a brain burning puzzle that you and your partner can sit down and work on together i strongly recommend the exit series absolutely now just remember as we have mentioned in previous uh reviews and topics the newer exit games are stronger. They've been mm. learning as they go. And one of the reasons we recommend Haunted Roller Coaster as a starter is not only is it on the easier scale, so you're 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 ramping into the system, but it's also one of their newer yes. escape rooms, and they've learned from prior game prior releases. So that is Exit the Haunted Roller Coaster. All right, my final two-player game recommendation for the night is going to be Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. If you want a two-player dungeon crawling experience and like some weight and difficulty with your games, I strongly recommend Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. No, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, not Gloomhaven. Now, full Gloomhaven is great two players. I'm not trying to deny that, but I don't recommend anyone new to the hobby spend the kind of money Gloomhaven costs until you play through Jaws of the Lion. Because for one, the Gloomhaven system is not easy, and Jaws of the Lion does a great job of onboarding new players. And to be honest, if it wasn't for that tutorial system that's in there, the first five missions, I wouldn't even recommend this to a couple that's new to the hobby, because there is that now the Gloomhaven, before Gloomhaven exists, that step-by-step -step five scenario 
slowly teach you a bit of the rules, I now feel comfortable recommending this even to new gamers. Now, no, this is not what I call a gateway game. Yes, I'm recommending it as a gateway, but like you're taking a big step here. This is not a light dungeon crawl romp where you're going to run around, roll some dice and kill a bunch of monsters. That's not what Gloomhaven is. This is a, a puzzle. A, a multiplayer cooperative dungeon crawling resource management puzzle where you are trying to figure out the optimum move every time to defeat the enemies. If that sounds like fun to you, this is a fantastic box with a ton of content for the price. Absolutely. that, And this is, you know, absolutely the way to start. Don't go out and buy Gloomhaven without no. buying Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. All right. I do have three honorable mentions i'm not going to get into as much detail on these ones i just want to fire them off quickly number one is undaunted normandy this is a two-player only card driven war game that is getting a ton of positive buzz online like the amount of people whose opinions i listen to that i respect podcasts i listen to regularly for their opinions and games is going nuts about undaunted normandy the only reason it's not on the list is i haven't had a chance to try this game uh, there is now Undaunted um, Africa or North Africa, the second part of this, which is a standalone expansion. People seem to be really loving this. Sounds like it's well worth picking up. I just haven't played it myself. All right. And that was Undaunted Normandy. All right. Next, if you want to talk about positive buzz in two-player games, the hotness right now is Watergate from Capstone Games. This has been winning all kinds of 2019 two-player game awards, has even been nominated for some 2019 Game of the Year awards. Find out why this wasn't on my list later during our review segment. All right, and that was Watergate. Finally, I want to finish off with Command and Colors Medieval. If you are looking for historic wargaming, hex encounter style like when you think of a war game and you think of um chits on a board i wanted to throw in a game on the list that fit that type of gaming and i think the commanding color series overall is the best in two-player war gaming i love every commanding color game now the medieval version is the most recent that just came out last year 2019 so hotness this is the up reason again it's not on the list i haven't actually played the medieval version the one i love the most so far is is ancients but it's great and later this year possibly it might even be early 2021 they're putting out a feudal japan edition that oh my god does that look good i am really hyped about the japan one but overall command and colors any of the games are fantastic these are great war games that are very accessible to new gamers as well as being deep enough to keep old Ron Yard's happy as well. Absolutely. And that is Command and Colors Medieval. Now, I've actually got a couple of uh, ones I want to mention in here. Okay. Uh, first off, and now this isn't on our list because you can't actually get it yet if you haven't already ordered it. But I think uh, if you can hold off until probably spring of next year, keep an eye out for Garinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Mm. Uh a great two-player game, but also great all the way up to four. Um, fantastic game that we've recovered here. Uh, it is out of pre-order at the moment, but uh, they should be reopening that up probably oh. in the Christmas season. Um, I... We know we've seen the tiles, so uh, they're they're well under uh, well on on their way for production on that. Yeah, I am really looking forward to getting our copy of Garento. That game looks fantastic. We we did the preview. We played a preview edition of the game, and it was one of the best abstract games I've ever played. Yeah. Really looking forward to that one from Grand Gamers Guild. And that was Garento. Yeah. And the component quality on it is just right up there now, now that we've seen them. Uh, and the other one would be Unmatched, which mm. I haven't played yet, but I have watched several games played and you know what people love this game it's a great game and it's, it's very flexible because you are playing various different figures against each other in unmatched combat between people like bruce lee and frankenstein yep yeah i gotta agree I, I you know what this was almost in the honorable mentions i i almost put it on there but like you i haven't played it i haven't actually sat down and watched someone play it's actually a remake of the original star wars epic duels game uh, from Restoration Games, um, something in Fog is like everyone was really upset, uh, really excited about Cobble and Fog. I think it's the latest expansion. I don't even know who that is. Um, 
it, it looks neat. I know friends of ours, um, Kator, Cat and Tori are fans of Unmatched. I've heard really good things. Yeah, that definitely definitely belongs to the honorable mentions. Again, haven't played it myself, so I couldn't tell you on that one. Yeah, no, I definitely honorable mentions. And then I suppose the last one I would throw in would be Funkoverse. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So they, they for people who haven't uh, checked out our review, the Funkoverse series of games, the most recent is Game of Thrones and Jurassic Park, I think are the latest ones. These are two player skirmish miniature war games for kids in a way like really gateway level, but still being solid miniature games like they did. They're the heavy war gamers sat down and went, let's make an accessible war game that kids and fans of pops will enjoy and managed to put out a fantastic light war game. And it's it's really interesting to see because people don't realize it's a war game, but like anyone who's played Warhammer Underworlds, for example, is like, oh, I see some war game roots here. There are a ton of these out. Uh, there's some great Prime Day deals on the Kool-Aid Man and the uh, the Game of Thrones. So you can have the, uh, I don't know, I don't know Game of Thrones characters. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, you could have the, whatever that blue thing is, fight the Kool-Aid Man. I don't know what the blue thing is. Probably a White Walker. That's the word. I was, I'm like, if I could think of it, it's 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 the, like the king that goes on the throne. I don't know. And so yeah, uh, the Funkoverse games definitely uh they can play more than two, but they're they're solid two player and they the two player sets are standalone. So if you go buy just the two character ones, that is a full game, yep. or they can be used to combine. Uh, and and the despite the fact oh. that legally they can't say the games can be played together because that would mash licenses, they are all intercompatible. So yes, you can have Dorothy from the Golden Girls go up against the Joker. Uh, and Unmatched Coblin Fog is basically a Penny Dreadful version with uh, Watson and Holmes, Dracula okay. and the Sisters, and Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, there you go. See, that makes more sense. I didn't recognize that term, Coblin Fog, to, yeah, so to for the, what that would mean. The, but yeah, the, the people British, were going nuts for that. The British, uh, British version, I guess, is that. Fair enough. All righty. So let's take a dip into our lobby and see. What, if anyone else has any suggestions they have for newer last three years two player games, yeah, our, our chat room's been busy talking about stuff, but there hasn't really been a lot of talk about the game. Yeah, so, we've had some the Duke did yep. come up multiple times. A few people are talking yep. about the Duke, and I think it's just they're in shock because we had a two player episode where we didn't talk about the Duke. But unfortunately, a you know, Catalyst Game Labs, owner of the Duke, um, haven't really been putting anything out for it lately, so. I would love to see a, a new edition or an updated version of the Duke out there. The Duke is one of my favorite two player games of all time. Although Probably have, my favorite. Although I have to say the current time. edition is a very solid purchase. Yeah. Uh, I assume it's still. Out yeah. The Duke Lord's legacy Duke, yeah. is the current printing of the Duke. Uh, there are still expansions. I don't have for that because I find the base games enough. I don't, yeah, I don't I, like I have the extra, but I don't feel I need them. Yep. Uh, Mountain Papa did know Polar Station in particular for the exit games was rather difficult. So you might not want to grab that one right away if it's your first one. Um, next week, we are hoping to review one of the exit games. I uh, don't know where I put it. <laughs> oh, it's behind us because it's in the thing. I can't remember. Oh, wow. The Catacombs of something. Okay. It's a uh, multiple part exit game. I'm hoping to get that one reviewed. All right. Uh, yeah, no other. Uh, I, yeah. I think we have a, a quieter than usual. Uh, Catacombs of lobby. Horror is the name of that. Catacombs of Horror. Thank you, Deanna. All right. Well, let's wrap. So, that up. As always, if you have any gaming or gaming night related questions, please send them to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. <laughs> Let's take a look at a Watergate, a two player only card driven ga game based on one of the most well known political scandals in history. All right, Watergate was designed by Theus Kramer and features art by Clement Hans, Alfred Victor Schultz, and published by more than 10 different. My particular copy, and the one we'll be looking at tonight, is from Capstone Games. This was published in 2019. Now, in addition to the black shattered glass covered version that I own, Capstone also produced a white box version that, as far as I can tell, was a Barnes & Noble exclusive. Note, the only difference between these two, cover, these two games is the box cover, so the review will apply to both. Now, Watergate plays two players and two players only, with games lasting anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, with most games being played 
lasting closer to the 20, 30 minute range. Now, while this wasn't a review copy, we still took the time to record an unboxing video for this very popular two player game. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. All right, there is not a lot to see here. This is a small box game uh, with a small four fold board. Uh, it's card driven, so there are two decks of cards with a couple reference cards. Cards are really nice quality. Um, they are large, though, like they're larger than you'd expect. I'm guessing they're probably tarot sized. I don't know. Um, they might be tarot sized, they may not. Uh, in addition, you do get a number of cardboard evidence tokens on a punch board, a bag to put those in, and just, a, uh, I think, nine or ten wooden markers. I, I have seen people complaining that they are not a standard size and yeah. sleeving them is a pain in the butt. Yeah, see, I, like I said, it's a weird size. I was guessing tarot size, but probably not then. Uh, overall, I got to say components are good quality to excellent. Uh, rules in particular are extremely well written. Like whoever the rule editor is at rule editor and designer at Capstone, thumbs up. Um, they even did the color coding thing, which we've talked about a ways to make your games easier to learn is to color code your rules and the, the various sections. So when you're looking up stuff, it's easy to find. And they did that, which is great. Uh, the rules are surprisingly thick, but that's actually because more than half of the book is historical information uh, for people like me who don't actually know that much about the history or the people involved in the Watergate scandal. Okay, now we joke a lot about not discussing the theme in our games but it's kind of hard to avoid mentioning this one. But does it matter? Does it matter who Woodward and Bernstein are? What the what are the Watergate tapes? Should I know the identity, the true identity of their source, Deep Throat? Nope, not at all. Doesn't, not in the least. This is an abstract strategy game with a pasted on theme pretty much 100%. I'd say about 90%, I guess. Like, so there's some themes about gaining motivation and what you're doing with evidence, but even the evidence is color-coded. It's yellow evidence, green evidence, and blue evidence. And you're just trying to collect the pictures of people, which they have names on them, so they're real people, to a picture of uh, Nixon in the center. None of it matters whatsoever. Uh, perhaps... The game mechanics are tied into the theme, but it's very slightly. Um, there is definitely the Watergate tapes come out, and that lets you flip some evidence from one side to the other. That's about it. It's all mechanical. Okay. Now, uh, I noticed a couple of reviews mentioning that there was a lot of reading on some of the actions, and it could have possibly benefited from a bit of iconography. Uh, again, going back to ways we've talked about making it easier. Uh, is that something you noticed, or...? I didn't mind reading the cards. Uh, to me, it's no worse than any other card game. Any card giving. If you played card giving dueling games like Magic or whatever, you're used to reading fairly extensive. It's like, do this, then do this, then do that. Or Terraforming Mars, right? It's like right. no worse than that. I guess they could have put some symbols for discard this card or draw it, but I don't see how that's any better than writing it. All right. Well, now that we know what you get, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, so on Watergate, one player is going to take on the role of the Nixon administration while another player is playing the editor of the Washington Press. The goal of the Washington Press is to connect two witnesses by a chain of evidence to Nixon. The Nixon player's goal is to build enough momentum to stay in office before that happens. All this plays out through a card-driven tug-of-war style mechanic. Now, to start a game, you're going to put the board on uh, between the two players. They're each, you each have a side. You're going to take your personal momentum cards, put them beside the board, shuffle your other 20 remaining cards, put the initiative card beside the board with the press facing. Uh, so press has initiative to start. Uh, evidence tokens are placed into a bag. The witness tokens are left off the board. Now, each round starts with players drawing a number of cards based on who has initiative. It's either five or four. Um, the Nixon player then is going to pull three evidence tokens from the bag and put them on the zero spot of the research track. They get to see these. The editor does not. The initiative token and one momentum token are also pushed on the zero spot. Now, I mentioned the research track. This is a track on the side of the board that has 11 spots on it. The middle being zero, then five spots counting down from one to five towards Nixon and five spots counting from one to five towards the, um, the editor. The initiative token and everything, everything starts at zero. Now, the evidence tokens are in three different colors, yellow, green, and blue, and there are a couple tiles that are mixes. So there's a tile that'll be like blue and yellow, and there'll be one that's yellow and blue. And again, the Nixon player gets to see these, but the editor does not. Okay, so nothing especially complex, no. uh, pretty straightforward. And again, all leaning towards this, this, this tug-of-war theme that mm -hmm. really kind of dominates the game. 
Yeah, exactly. So now the game, the player is going to play a card, then the opponent is going to play a card, go back and forth. The person with initiative is going to get one more action than the other player. So having initiative is a big part in this game. Each card has two ways to be played. Every card's got a number and an evidence token color showing in the top left of the card. If you use it for that, you ignore the rest. The other part of the card is a, as Sean mentioned earlier, large block that describes an action. Play a card for you, it's really going to move one of those things on the research towards your side, the number on the card. If you're moving evidence, your card has to match the evidence color. So it's like, oh yeah, blue. But if I play a three, I move a blue evidence three towards my side. If I, I could instead move the initiative or I could move that momentum token. If you ever get something all the way to your side, so to the five spot, you can claim it right then and then it can't get pulled back the other way. So when, once you get the five, it's yours guaranteed. Right. So that's, you know, you've got, you, you've, you've got all the evidence. It's locked in. It's, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't deny the evidence sort of thing. Right. You can't, you can't get rid of it or you've locked in initiative or this year you have, or I don't even know if it's a year, this, this turn, you have the momentum guaranteed. Right. Now the action cards, this is a card driven exception based game, like every card game out there. Um, most of the cards are event cards. You do the big thing on the card and then it's removed from the game. These cards are, again, thematically all tied to actual historic events that happened during the Watergate scandal. Um, in addition to events, the Nixon deck has conspirators. These do give something. They do some kind of event, but stay in the deck. They can be used a number of turns. Similarly, the editor has journalist cards, and they do the same thing. You do something with it, and it goes to your discard and can be used again. Now, these do all kinds of things. Some of them will allow players to place witness markers onto the board. Um, which is one of the goals of the game is to try to connect them. The Nixon player can, when they place witness tokens, place them face down. So the witnesses are the different people. I can't remember. There's like nine or so of them that go on the outside. So if the editor finds a witness, they go face up and they're a witness for the editor, right? For the paper, which is what they're trying to win. Whereas if Nixon finds the evidence, the, the witness, uh, the administration got to them first. However, they, they got to them and then that person's placed face down. So you can't use that witness. Now, the actions on these cards are the meat of the game, and there are too many of them. Everyone is unique. Everyone has its own page in the rulebook describing how to use it in case you're confused. Far too many to get into here what they do, but they do all kinds of things like take evidence tokens early, draw extra evidence tokens, move things, research track, usually move multiple things like move two evidence and the thing and do this. Force your opponents to do cards, take an extra turn, seize initiative. 20 different basic effects on each player's deck. Right. So yeah, that's a, a hunk, of, a hunk of things to remember. It's not like you're going to be memorizing all those cards anytime soon. Oh, and that I a huge part of relearning to enjoy the game is the time to learn what your opponent's deck and do. The action play just continues back and forth until both players are out of cards. They played their four or five cards. At the end of each round, now here's where this research track matters in the tug of war, you're going to get everything that's on your side of the track. Evidence collected is placed on the board. Now the board is a big cork board with just a bunch of interconnecting strings with pins and you're going to put your evidence on a spot. And what you are trying to do as the editor is to connect a path of evidence tokens between two of the witnesses to Nixon. Whereas Nixon does the same thing, but they're placing the evidence tokens face down, which is blocking a spot. So they're trying to stop the editor from making this connection of two witnesses to Nixon. Momentum tokens you collect, and that just shows that that, whatever, that round, you have the momentum. After collecting a set number of momentum tokens, the editor unlocks some powerful abilities. Uh, again, these are historic events like the Watergate trials or the impeachment of the president for collecting their fifth one. Now the Nixon player doesn't get anything for collecting these, but they do win the game if they're able to collect five of them, which represents them having enough momentum to make it to the end of their term. This is one of the ways that the, the, the administration can win the game. Next, the player who took the initiative token pretty simply gets the initiative next turn. If it's still sitting on the zero spot, you actually just swap. So initiative flips the other player. Game continues until either Nixon has collected five Minson tokens, Nixon wins, the momentum tokens run out, another way Nixon can win, or the editor of the Washington Post manages to connect two witnesses through Nixon or to Nixon through a chain of evidence, which is, of course, an editor win. 
Right. So if only Nixon had had a Republican dominated Senate, he too could have avoided impeachment. Yes, <laughs> I don't know if there's a particular card in there for that one. Uh, now, on to my thoughts about the game. Now that you know how to play, that's it. It's a tug of war. I have heard a ton of great things about this game. Like all kinds of board game media. Everyone is talking about Watergate. At this point, as of uh, actually technically two days ago, this game has had seven different award nominations. It's won three of those, including the 2019 Golden Geek Best Two-Player Board Game Award. That's a big one. That's from the users of Board Game Geek, the alpha gamers in our community. This game has a lot of fans. Every time I share a picture of this game on Twitter or talk about it on Facebook, I have people commenting about how much they love this game. People have a lot of love for this game. I'm sorry to say I am not one of those people. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It has a very strong community, but I do notice that there is a quiet undercurrent of people who do feel the same as you. And we'll get yep. what it, we'll get into what that feeling is. But uh, they are there, so you're not yep. unique, uh, <laughs> just not uh, as loud as the people who really love this game. There you go. It's good. It's good to know I'm not alone. At least I feel slightly better. Um, I will say, like positively, I was impressed by the quality. Uh, the design is solid. Like, it, the, there is a solid game here underlying this theme. I was extremely impressed by the size. Like, this is one of those small footprint games. This should be perfect for Deanna and I. These are the games we bring to Jack's Castro Pub on a weekend, and we have some pints and be playing. Uh, plus, for an abstract game, and realize that's what this is. This is an abstract strategy game that happens to have a Watergate theme. Uh, there's some good meat here, like especially trying to learn those cards. So it's nice to find a heavier small two-player game because there aren't a lot of those out there. Most of the two-player games out there are kind of light and fluffy and fun. This is definitely a heavy strategy game. The rules were fantastic. Like some, again, some of the best rules I've ever seen in a rule book. And I got to say, I appreciate all the history that's in there for people who don't know it. This isn't a complicated game either though, despite the weight like, I just taught you how to play, and I'm pretty sure, Sean, if we sat down right now and played, you'd be able to play just based on my description of it. It's pretty simple. It's a tug of war, stuff back and forth. So it's interesting. I see a lot of people referring to this as Twilight Struggle, the easy version, uh, right? It's It's got a lot of that, that, that back and forth balance, but it's not the heavy weight yep. slog that Twilight Struggle is. Yeah, so basically... It, it wasn't what I expected from the game. And I don't know what I expected, but this wasn't it. Like, I, I don't know. I expected something. People keep talking about how dramatic the game is and how stressed out they get and how they keep pulling it back from the brink, right? And I, we never really got that because this game basically is a tug of war between two players for five actions, objects each round. Three pieces of evidence, the initiative, and the momentum. And you're just playing tug of war with those five objects Rinse, repeat, do it again. Play tug of war with those five objects. Play tug of war with those five objects. And just keep doing that. Like, generally, it just keeps going like that. You get a bit, I pull it a bit back. You get a bit, I pull it a bit back. And then someone plays a big event that messes everything up. Suddenly, a whole bunch of stuff moves. Or the token you thought you were going to collect vanishes from the board. Or it was on your fourth. And suddenly, it's all the way down on the opponent's three spot. Now, at that point, you either have a counter what just happened, or you don't. And that's it. You're like, oh, you did it. You pulled the big move. Good job. Or, oh, no, no, I can counter that. And and now, to be fair, this is this seems to be what really drives a lot of people to the game, um, to to having that 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 sudden shift. And, and so you're 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 tugging back and forth until someone manages to get that one card that makes it go the other way, and then the game is done. And that is a, is, is another big feature of this game mm -hmm. is that it's quick. Right. Oh, yeah. So a lot of people are saying, you know, you play it for that big moment and then you jump right back into it because you haven't been playing all that long and you want more. Uh, fair enough. Yes. I, I was impressed by the mechanics and concept. I get it. I, and I see why people might like it, like you just said. But I, I don't know. I just didn't find it fun. Like f Tug of War wasn't that aging. Like it, it's an interesting concept. You're pulling stuff back. And I'm like, I'm playing like five games of Tug of War at once. And it's just way more abstract. Like I said before, you asked about the theme. 
none of that matters. Like, like you could be pulling back and forth. I don't know. It could be a fishing game with five different types of fish and which angler gets the initiative to cast first and it would still work just as well. And the goal of the one team is to connect two fish to the, the prize in the middle where the opponent, I don't know why there'd be a bad guy in a fishing game. All right. So maybe my, maybe my, my, my theory of turning into a fishing game may not work, but whatever it's, it's Pokemon and you're trying to catch it. And the other team's team rocket, and you're trying to find evidence of different Pokemon in the fields and Team Rocket's trying to hide the evidence, whatever. It, it would still work. The game would still work. I expected more from that. It was definitely more abstract. There wasn't really anything here that made me feel like I was actually collecting evidence or putting clues together. No, it was just I was putting counters on a board. Right. Now, it could be that you're not connected to the theme, right? You're not American. It's true. Uh, you've got no connection whatsoever no. to Watergate. Um, and a history buff may find more connectivity into the actions than not. I, again, I haven't played this, so mm. I can't say for sure. Uh, but uh, that there is that possibility. It's true. The other thing I found that I that surprises me by how many people like this game is how high the random factor is it is in the learning curve too because until you've memorized those 20 cards, well 40 cards I guess because you got to know your own cards and your opponent's cards, the game's almost impossible to predict. And like I said earlier, it's like you're back and forth back and forth, boom, you did the big thing. And it's like, "Oh, well you got the big thing before I got the big thing, so you win." Which is all just a matter of what card came up first in the deck, right? Like you, you, you're playing, especially in your early games, you're like, oh, I'm doing well. Everything's coming my way. I'm going to get all the evidence this turn. And then all of a sudden your opponent drops a card that ruins everything. All the planning you did that turn, your, your whole organization, your whole plan gone out the window because they had the right card. And I got to say, knowing what your opponent's cards do does greatly mitigate this because there's that, oh, wait, I don't want to pull too much because they might have that card. But then there's the randomness factor. Like at most your opponent has five of their cards at their hand. If they didn't have the initial, they only have four. That's only four out of 20. Like you can do the math in your head somewhat, but it's still very random. Like, do they have the card or not? I guess there could be a whole poker like bluffing element to the game that I didn't really get into of the, oh, well, if you try to put that through, I got the filibuster in my hand. I'll be able to stop you. And meanwhile, you're bluffing. Maybe that's an aspect of the game I didn't dive into. But to me, it just felt very random. And I can see how some players might, found it to be funny. like most of them, i'm like ah, i had some of this oh okay here you go. stop yeah yeah put all the evidence okay let's play the next round well now that you got so much evidence there's no way i'm catching up i guess i'll play this like that's more how i felt playing this game right yeah it's interesting i i t the reviews for it are very mixed um a lot of people mentioned 13 days uh yep. as a comparative uh game uh, both as difficulty and, and, and mechanics and everything. Uh, so 13 days, the Cuban Missile Crisis came out in 2016. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a fan of that, I think you're probably going to be a big fan of Watergate as well. Right. Um, it's, it, there are really mixed reviews on it. I mean, they are trending high uh, and there are a lot of people who really love this game. Mm -hmm. But if you actually start looking through the people who have taken the time to, to put their reviews in there. There are a lot of people out there who are commenting on the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a meaty game up until the end where it becomes the randomness really takes hold as yeah. who gets that card um, and things like that. So you're not alone. Uh, but I think there are definitely uh, a group of people who enjoy that level of both thought and randomness because of the Back speed it gets. Um, and, and and the fact that you can sit down and you know play three or four games without too much difficulty, swapping you know swapping turns back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, or or you know I really want to work on Nixon tonight. Let's play a few games and, and see if I can get my Nixon uh, mm -hmm. technique down. No, fair enough. Uh, I got to say the uh, Twilight Struggle. It's been too long since I played it. Felt like I was way more in control of my fate. So I, I enjoyed that a lot more than I did this. Though Twilight Struggle, when we played, took us two nights. It was a leave it set up overnight, go to bed and play again in the morning. So yeah, it's there is one. definitely that there. Yeah, yeah. It's a bigger one. I don't know. I, I I appreciate the fact people like this game. Like that, I, I there's a lot of love for this game and I'll, I'll have fun with it. That's great. This one just doesn't seem to be one for Deanna and I. Now, due to this, despite all the buzz, I got to say, try before you buy. Like that, th this is very firmly in that. This is not a game 
recommend anyone and tried because it won the 2019 game of the year awards or it's nominated for the games 100 don't just go with the hype on that i think you want to try this one out before you buy it which unfortunately is a little difficult in today's society but if you can give it a try it's a very well designed game it's a really neat abstract um it's kind of it's interesting to see this theme in a game we'll put it that way even if the theme isn't that well tied in I, it just the tug of war back and forth ruined by a random card draw just wasn't my taste. But that might be the perfect game for you and all the power to you. Yeah. Now, just remember that uh, this game is a about a two and a bit weight, where a Twilight mm. Struggle is a three and a half. Yeah. So uh, there you go. That's so, a you good... know, it, there's a significant weight shift when you're moving from this to Twilight Struggle. And you see that when you get into, you know, your your time played, essentially. I just I don't see the comparison. I was thinking that's probably because I haven't played Twilight Struggle in a long time. And like, yeah, Twilight Struggle, you have that tug of war, but it's in each individual part of the board. And it's like, it's, I don't know. It's not just, I, I don't know. I don't think I need to say anymore. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, should, I should play Twilight Imperium again. Then maybe I can compare the two. I really should play Twilight Imperium again, to be honest. It was a really good game when we did play it. But yeah, unfortunately, Watergate, not for me. Well, for a slightly more in-depth look at Watergate, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? All right, first off, I kept saying Twilight Imperium. I guess I meant Twilight Struggle. The Too many Twilight games. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Twilight Imperium, two-player, is not good. All right, so every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, other cool gaming stuff that's going on. This week we're going to cover two weeks, but that doesn't really matter because I only really got in gaming in one week. So we are going to cover through some stuff. So first off, um, we're going to start with Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. That we did take a week off, but the week previous we have played. Deanna and I are continuing to play through. Um, again, I, I feel like we're, we're becoming advocates. This is our new Azul. I, I am really enjoying this excellent addiction addiction Blah. maybe introduction to gloomhaven um one of the big things we had is we actually failed and we feel bad we did terrible and i think this is fantastic i i realize it seems strange but the thing is this proves that jaws of the lion is not a cakewalk it's not a joke despite being an introduction to gloomhaven featuring streamlined rules it's not easy. It's not like, oh, it's simple Gloomhaven. No, it's not. Once you get past the tutorial missions, that difficulty ramps up quickly. Now, I'm not saying it goes crazy, but it gets to be on par with what you expect from the full game of Gloomhaven after that first five. Indeed. While there are tweaks and adjustments to the rules and design, you still can't get, the fa get past the fact that there are a lot of rules to keep track of. Yeah. And the one thing I am pleased to say, um, we realized just how brutal it can be, which basically was just like the, okay, we need to play a little more attention. Um, we are now moving on to new things. We, we've gotten past that mission. We are, we are stepping things up and progressing through it. Interesting to note, we did get a branching path. Um, and we also got to a point where a previous the unlock scenario is now locked for eternity and cannot ever be played. So I thought that was cool to see that they are actually putting that aspect in Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. Another thing that's really important to note that I don't know if people realize about Jaws of the Lion is there is no casual play. So if you miss a treasure chest in Jaws of the Lion, there is no replaying the mission to get the reward. You cannot do that in this version of the game. So that is something we actually omitted in our comparison of the two games because I never noticed it. And I haven't seen anyone else talk about that either. So there is no casual play. There's no open up your map and pick a scenario you previously played before and play through it again to grind. You can't do any of that in Jaws. And don't forget now that our actual videos are looking better on YouTube now as well. Yeah, you get to see Deanna and I throughout it staring at our cards. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I have to assume they're more entertaining to watch. I haven't been seeing the YouTube numbers spike or anything, so we'll see. Um, next, I want to move on to some online games, um, mainly just because we've been skipping over this. Uh, Sean and I pretty much constantly are playing games on Board Game Arena, and we don't tend to talk about it in here, but technically I consider these games played, and I just thought we'd bring it up this week since it's been a while since we've actually mentioned them. And I wanted to add a couple comments on what I've been playing at least. 
Sean's free to add in if there's stuff you've been playing. So one of the big games that we are playing a number of games of in a row is Terra Mystica. I am still really enjoying it. I am loving the fact that we have played this so much. So it's, this is one of those things uh, the, the whole 10 by 10 challenge is derived on this, where there's a lot to be enjoyed for deep diving one game and playing it a number of times in a row and really exploring the ins and out of the game. And that's what we're getting to do with Terra Mystica. And that has been really cool. At this point, I think I've tried all the different races, but I'm not positive because when we started up this last game, I looked and clicked on one and I'm like, whoa, I don't remember that ability. So I'm playing someone new this game. I don't know if I would have ever did this with the physical copy, like I can't see having played 26 games of Terra Mystica with my physical copy, just the amount of time to take it out and teach the rules and everything else. So I got to say big thing, thumbs up for board game arena, letting us play that many games. And it's been really cool. Having played that many times that I'm now finding favorite races. I like and learning how to adopt my strategies, not just based on who I'm playing, but who my opponents are playing. And that has really brought the game to another level. Yeah, and I have to say, this one hasn't really gotten me to that other level yet. Uh, while I think I'm improving, I don't feel like it's at a rate I'm happy with. Uh, and mm. I think one of the problems I'm having is that this is a game that benefits from focus. Yeah, And... Uh, one of the things I tend to play on board game gig are games that don't really necessarily need that focus. Uh, and I think one thing I probably should be doing actually mm. is using the note functionality on board yep. game arena to sort of better keep track because we're not playing. It. Uh, whereas I think if we were to do, you know, one, Hey, let's once a week, let's sit down and play one game of Terra Mystica. Cause it doesn't actually mm -hmm. take all that long in a real time game. Uh, I would, I would, I would get better faster. Um, True. The other option is I might need to just go sci-fi and get a hold of a copy of Project Gaia and uh, see if the theme makes a difference. Yeah, is there a way to play Gaia Project online? Not, not yet. Yeah, I didn't think so, because I'd like to try that one now that I played so much Terra Mystica. Another thing you might want to try with Terra Mystica is take the same race every time and see if you can master that one race. Yeah, and I, how I, to play I, haven't, that. I haven't been exploring as many races as you, for sure. Huh. There's, I'm generally sticking with the starter starter races oh, okay um, yeah see every time i'm trying to buy a new one so <laughs> all right next up is seven wonders uh we've been playing tons of this since it came out but i wanted to call this one out again because we've been playing with the new edition of seven wonders at this point we're about five games in with the new one and i'm starting to think i like it even better i i am really liking the tweaks they have done over the original seven wonders it just feels like i have more valid choices instead of just okay here's my hand yep that's a good card pass it on oh that's the good card pass it on now i'm like oh do i get this or do i get that or should i take this and i i it just feels like i have more control over my my destiny in it than i did in the previous yeah and i definitely got in the groove i know when we first played it you you felt better with it right away and i was still yeah. unsure but no i've definitely uh gotten into it and i'm no longer missing the old version yeah, so if you own Seven Wonders, I think it's like this is moving into the physical world. I do think it's probably worth picking up the new edition. Like I, I, w I wish there was a board game trade in where I could trade in my old edition and get some credit towards the new version because I would upgrade my physical copy if I could. Uh, finally, for online games, the other one I want to bring up is Clans of Caldonia. I am loving this on Board Game Arena. Now I'm still struggling with strategy because uh, every game I'm like, I got this one. No problem. I got it. And then the final score comes up and Deanna destroys us by 80 points. So I don't know. I'm missing something. There's an aspect of Clans of Caldonia that I'm, I, I don't know. I'm skipping over. I, I think I'm not paying enough attention to what the scoring tiles are doing. I don't know what it is, but just the digital implementation of this is still one of the best games on board game arena. I think. Yeah, no, the, the implementation of this is fantastic, except uh, there have been, this game, more than almost any other, I find myself with, oh, shoot, I need to undo, and I can't. Oh. Um, and in particular, the uh, the scoring portions, uh, there's a, a, the, the last clan I played where you get to uh, do the milk thing, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't clear whether or not I was going to be able to do that at the end of the game, even though you do production at the end of the game but you didn't oh. do the milk thing at the end of the game you didn't and no oh, that's and, weird I and i you would have yeah it was it was frustrating and i i there was been a couple of little things like that where i, I can't remember the order that the game right 
does things online and I had messed up like that. So I, I, I am enjoying the game. I am, I feel like I'm progressing better in clans than I am in Terra Mystica, <laughs> but I am still struggling at, at times with some of those the interface and uh, the interface time. moments. So uh, I, I would have thought you'd get to milk, make milk, but I don't yeah, know. I, no. I didn't play that race. Uh, the, for me, I, I am still loving uh, Rally Man GT. We are. I still haven't tried we're, that. We're one, getting yeah. in on that, and and it's really uh, been a fantastic game. Uh, again, it's a push your luck game. There, in in many ways, it's a better themed version of Can't Stop uh, mm. to to some degree. Um, but the that competition and and the the race track and and then moving around the track and the chance to spin out mm. off the side of the track really makes it more engaging than a lot of the other push your luck games out there, like Can't Stop. Uh, right. And I think that's why I, it's really sort of gripped me more than a lot of the others. Fair enough. All right, moving into meat space, into the physical world. Uh, one of the games we've been playing is Watergate uh, in preparation for today's review. Uh, as noted in the review, this one just didn't really win us over, um, as it seems to have won over almost everyone else. At least everyone was loud. The the vocal majority definitely likes this game. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, it was feeling like we were missing something or we were playing wrong so we watched uh rodney smith has a fantastic how to play video like if you want to see how to play watergate man watch rodney's video it's nice and quick um we weren't doing anything wrong like i i don't know i, I checked reviews i checked strategies i guess this is a perfect example of no matter how much everyone seems to love a game no matter how good the hype is no matter how high the board game geek rating it's not going to be for everyone no, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's every game, every game is different. And I think um, the weight of it is it might, I think, I think you were you guys were probably expecting something a little high, a little, you know, more yeah. like a two and a half to a three. Well, especially than from Capstone. Capstone games tends to make like, like Pipeline and Tricurion and um, oh, what's the, the Spinning Jenny watershed? I forget the name of it. Yeah. Like I, I just expect did more from capstone in a way yep. which it's good to see capstone broadening their <laughs> their their game base but arkwright thank you deanna yeah it's interesting but you know again games uh, aren't for every everybody uh you know it's almost reassuring is like i feel that i'm much more picky about games you know yeah. you you definitely like a broader range of games yep. than i do uh but it's nice to know there are some games out there that you really just don't connect no. with yeah, I don't love them all. That's for sure. We were talking about that during our coffee break, right? Like I, when I try to review games, I tend to review games I like because I tend to buy games I like. And even when I get the pile of obligation and review copies of games, I only contact publishers when there's games I'm excited about. Now, now and then a publisher will send us something blind and we'll get surprised. Now in this particular case, and I didn't mention this in the review, I did not buy that game. I did not buy Watergate. I had no interest in the theme whatsoever, but I was tempted by it because of all the hype. And where that game came from is I won a contest and they sent me a free copy of the game and I got to play it. And I'll admit, I'm glad I didn't buy that one. Like I'm glad I didn't spend my money on it. So there's definitely, I, I don't love all the games though. It, it may seem like it, if you watch the show that we have mostly positive reviews, but that's more based on the fact of I'm more excited about talking about the games I liked. Yeah, Absolutely. Now, another one we have been working through is the Pathfinder Adventure card game. Uh, we are playing through the Dragon's Demand. This has been really enjoyable so far. Now that we've kind of got it down, now that we're not spending 20 minutes out of a 30-minute session looking up stuff in the book, it's actually proving to be quite fun. Um, one tip, though, is count your cards before you start. Like when you, you know, the box, you got your divider and you pull your pack one out in your pack two don't just assume you grabbed everything because uh this past week we had an extreme play where i don't know how we managed to win it was the closest game ever i felt like i was gonna die every second of that game and that would be because when packing up i noticed i had left four of my 11 cards in the deck all my weapons and spells we managed with my spellless unequipped artificer so ouch uh, now, aside from just double, double checking and going through, is there uh, a different way of storing or some way to help you avoid that in the future? Uh, I assume it's not just as simple as you have to take all the cards and if there are any cards in the box, you've done something wrong. 
you know what? It's just my fault. It's, it's just a cardboard box with dividers, and there's a divider that says character one, and a divider says character two, and all mine should be in one slot, and all these should be in the other. If we were playing more characters, there'd be more dividers. Now, this is something um, we had talked about possibly reviewing this game today, and it was something I was going to bring up in the review, but since we didn't, I'll bring it up here. One of the things I am really disappointed with in this 2019 core set is their bo the box is now the DC deck building box, or the legendary box. It is, here is a cardboard box with two card three rows and here's right. some pieces of foam to keep your cards apart and that's it right which is horrible for sorting cards and dividers whereas the previous every previous pathfinder adventure game card set had a plastic insert that had specific slots for all the different types of cards so your weapons went here your armor went here your spells went here not only that there was adventure packs you could buy that were a little smaller the insert had a spot to put each of them so if you bought the, you know, you bought the the whatever dragon, I'm trying to rise of the lords set, and then bought chapter two, three, four, five, six, and seven. There was a spot to put two, three, four, five, six, and seven in the box. Now you have your generic board game box with dividers and foam, and I'm really disappointed by that. That is, that is the biggest thing I don't like about this core set. But from stand it, let produce it for ten to twenty dollars US cheaper. So I kind of get it, like like. I give up for 30 bucks. So am I going to pay 30 bucks for a plastic insert? So, so I get it, but yeah, I, I, you know what? It's just dumb on my part. Like the start of every game is supposed to be, you have a list of, so a big part of that game, again, I, we didn't do the full review. So I'll mention it here is you have to actually build your character and your character card tells you how many of each card type you get. So my artificer says spells too. So I start with, I, I pick two spells and it says weapons too. And I pick two weapons and it says allies one. And I pick one ally and so on. And like my particular character gets like six items. Cause that's what I do as an artificer. Whereas D is a mage. She gets like six spells. And at any time you can build those out of any of the level you are at or lower cards in the box. So I could at the start of every game, go pick a bunch more zero level items and swap it up. Now in general, you're going to make your character how you like it and keep it every game and just keep those cards together. But the start of every game is supposed to be put your card down and verify that, yes, I have two weapons. Yes, I have two spells. Yes, I have one item. Yes, I have one of this. So I don't have anything extra. And we didn't do that. We just assumed we put it all away right. So it's kind of on me for not card counting first. Fair enough. All right, finally, the last game we got to the table this last week, and it's too bad Jeff Seuss is in the chat room tonight, would be for the queen so first off thanks to sheila and jeff for the awesome signed copy of this game that they gave to us that was that was a really cool surprise they came and dropped that off at a nice socially distance they were down the alley lot left on the porch kind of thing so that was pretty awesome for anyone who doesn't know for the queen this is a pass the stick style card driven indie rpg that i first got to try at queen city conquest last year and i instantly fell in love with I have been wanting Deanna to try this ever since playing it. And the reason for this is because Deanna is actually not very comfortable with on the fly improvisation in RPGs. And I actually think For the Queen is a great learning tool for people trying to improve their skills at on the on on, on the fly improv. Yeah, so it's a nice game at home is certainly a more comfortable place to work on that skill than in a crowded hall, con hall with a bunch yes. of strangers. Yeah, like I definitely wouldn't recommend anyone play For the Queen if they're not comfortable role-playing that type of improv with a with a brand new group. But if you have a group that's used to traditional D&D &D or cyberpunk or Marvel superheroes even, who are very much used to the DM player um, relationship of the players asking the DMs, can I do this over and over? Because that's pretty much what most traditional role-playing games are. Switching to having complete control over the entire world, this is a great way to, to broaden your minds and, and broaden try, try to experience that. So what I did is I broke this out on a date night game, game night, thinking that with two players, this might be a little more intense and intimate, like something like we're going to play this together and tell this story together. And I'm sorry to say I was disappointed. Now the game works, two players, but not well. Now the biggest problem is a lot of For the Queen, in For the Queen, you are playing an entourage who is traveling with the queen, foreign country, and a huge part of the character building story is the relationships between the characters and the players in that entourage. And while when there's only two players, 
the, that web doesn't exist, that network. You don't get that interaction. It's always the one other member of the retinue is always the other player. So it just didn't work that well. Every time, it just didn't make for the whole connections. Yeah, it's hard to spin a web with only two points of contact. Yeah, exactly. Now, also with two players, you don't get the, the cross-examination. So a big part of For the Queen is the basic game is you draw a card, you read the question of the card, and you answer. But then where the, the emergent gameplay happens is the other players then, based on what you said, can then question you more, right? So you might have a card that says, uh, when did the queen do something nice for you? Once. And you're like, well, at one time, the queen, when my parents died, gave me, brought me in and let me stay in their home overnight and blah, blah, blah. And tell a little story. And then it could just pass on to the next person. But then other players like Sean could be like, well, wait, what was the gift they gave? Oh, well, they gave me this jewelry box. that looks like this. Oh, what was in the jewelry box? Someone else could ask. Oh, well, it had this. Oh, what did that matter to you? And then someone else could be like, wait, which part from that jewelry box did you lose? And then you get in this like really neat story with all this detail. Well, with only two of us, there wasn't really a lot of that cross-contamination. So a lot of it was when the queen did something nice. Oh, they once gave me a gift. And then the next person drew a card. And it just, it, it, like, the game's meant to take up to two hours. And we were done a half deck game in 20 minutes. It just wasn't enough there. Well, we're going to have to give that a try when the pandemic ends or give one of the online versions a go. Uh, yeah. Heck, maybe, uh, maybe call, uh, you know, hook up with uh, Jeff and Sheila online and do a, uh, no, that's a, good do, idea. Do a, do a group game uh, online because there are a bunch of different ways to get to do that one online easily. Yeah, yeah. Like even just I could take the deck and I'm the one that reads you the questions. Yeah. Like, like it would work as a without any additional tools. We could just be on Zoom and yep. I'll just here. I'll read you the cards. You answer. <laughs> Like, I love the queen game. Like, I, I still, this this isn't a hack on For the Queen. I would say don't put two-player on that box. Uh, the box says, like, two to five or something. No, no, this is not a two-player game. And and we were pushing it, just trying it with two players. I can't recommend it with two players. It was not not a great experience. Like, the one good thing is Deanna got it. Like, like she's like, yeah, I get it. She still has a hard time thinking on the fly like that. And what it is, she doesn't like being put on the spot, where if you don't like that, that's what happens every turn on For the Queen. And that's something else that if there were more people, there'd be more downtime, right? There'd be more time to recharge while yep. it's going around. Yep. So, so overall, I still think it's a great tool. Like, like Deanna had never done anything like this. And I now think she's that one step closer to being more comfortable with that style of role playing. Excellent. Well, how about a uh, look ahead? All right. Well, with um, Prime Day finally wrapping up, hopefully, and my throat finally feeling better, I'm looking forward to getting back on track like we we definitely like i basically took a whole week off which was kind of nice and then got way too much work and not enough sleep due to prime day so it's kind of up and down uh next week is are going to be our halloween our horror our spooky spoopy whatever you want to call it episode uh we're going to be talking about the best horror games out there right now so this is going to be another one where we're looking at the new hotness we're looking at modern games stuff that's readily available on selves um we will see on the reviews. I am hoping to review two horror-filled games. Uh, we'll see with the Prime Day and everything going on, but I'm hoping to get through the Alien RPG starter set from uh, Free League Publishing and exit the Catacombs of Horror, which is a big box exit game that's twice as big as any of the other ones, plays twice as long, and is also supposed to be rather difficult. So we'll see how we do on a difficult exit game instead of one of the easier ones but again i gotta get these done by next wednesday so we'll see it, it may it may be one or the other at this rate we'll see now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support matt lichtenwaller thanks matt roger malosh thanks matt uh, roger <laughs> thanks matt zopi thanks matt no sorry <laughs> zopi thank you david miller jr thanks david brian kurtz love the new shirt well that was the double bell that means my shift's coming to an end and we're gonna have to drop that portcullis though the doors to the lobby are closed you can always find us across the web and social media as tabletop bellhop one word drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content if you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you can tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop.
Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. New York, Toronto time and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube every Tuesday at 2 a.m. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.